Wolf is hosting a men's hockey night on Saturday. You can arrive from 5. Game starts at 6. You can arrive from 5. It is in a suite where there is food. And having been at the last one, the food was top-notch. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not here next weekend. Uh, Chris and I are away in Toronto to the equip there. But uh, if you are around and you want to go to the hockey night, you need to chat to Wolf ASAP so that he can give you a ticket. And he's actually got them with him today. Bonus. So if you do want to go, please, if you can chat uh, to Wolf and get your tickets from him today. If you only remember in the week, I'm sure you can get hold of him somehow. He has got a phone, so you can make a plan. Uh, the, you know, sometimes it's good to go back and, and, and look at some basics, because I think sometimes in, in church life, we, uh, we just assume that people know everything, right? And there's new people coming in, but we never go back and look at the basics. We think people get it through osmosis or something. They just hang about here. They get, they get it all. And uh, so I think sometimes it's good to go back and look at the basic from time to time so that it w we remember what it is. Because our human nature, we like to take things and make them better. And, and, and so sometimes we start adding things that aren't supposed to be there. And we start complicating things. Uh, when we should keep them pretty simple. I think a lot of the Bible was meant to be pretty simple uh, for people to understand. The people in those times knew exactly what was meant by, by, by what was spoken. Uh, the times where they were confused, and then the Bible says, oh, man, like when Jesus spoke about the bread of life, they're like, oh, yeah, what's this? You know. But generally what was said was meant to be easy to understand. Just sometimes we take it and we complicate it. And... Uh, Sometimes it's good to go back to the basics and remember, actually, this was the point. We've added too much to this. We need to shake it. You know, that's why it's good sometimes when the church gets a shaking. Get rid of all that stuff we've built into it that's not supposed to be there. This morning, we're going to look at the ministry of reconciliation. All right, we've been given this ministry. Paul says that, that God, and we'll read the scripture as soon as he reconciled man to him through Jesus, and then gave us this, this uh, work, this ministry of reconciliation as well. So when, you, when you're looking at reconciliation between people, that means there was a relationship. It's not the start of a relationship. It's a bringing it back together again. Much like Chris and Christy. They're reconciling over this weekend. Chris is not enjoying it. We've got to have a chat this afternoon, bro. <laughs> Something, yeah. So let's go back to the beginning of the story, back to the Garden of Eden. It says God had created man, he created Adam and Eve. And it says he used to walk around with him in the afternoon, in the cool of the day. So when they, they sinned, they ate, the, they ate the apple, and they realized, oh, hang on. And uh, then Jesus, or God came to walk with them, and, and they went and hid away from him. Genesis 3 verse 8 said, they heard the sound of God walking, and God actually called out to them, hey, where are you? Because he's going to hang out with them. They're going to go and have a conversation together. But as we said, Adam and Eve sinned, and now the sin wedge came in, ruining the relationship. And bringing that separation. And from that day, God has wanted the reconciliation to take place. There was an, a parting of ways that God didn't want. But sin had caused. And God wanted that to be repaired. And so he sent Jesus. I think we sent, did we, was it in the pre-service prayer? Or someone said, like, man, Lord, that you sent Jesus out to us. Anyway. Pre-service prayers are often better than the preach, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder who's preaching next week? <laughs> the Colossians 1, verse 21 to 23 says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight 
without blemish, and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to you to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. That's the gospel. You were once alienated from, from God, and now through Jesus we can be restored and reconciled back with the Father again. There's one part here I just wanted to hang just for a sec and just read again because sometimes we, we read through these and we, we, we just don't think about what that means, the application. It says, to present you holy in his sight. Through Jesus, that's how the Father sees you. Just, just let that sink in a little bit. That's how God sees you through Jesus. Holy in his sight. Without blemish. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> Free from accusation. It's amazing. That's how he sees you. He's just come. You know, sometimes we allow these things, not seeing it this, not believing this well enough that we, we, we separate ourselves from the Lord. How can I go into his presence? Look at what I've done. Well, if you've done something, just repent, say, I'm sorry, and walk in the things that Jesus has made possible for you. Holy, without blemish. And free of accusation. For me, that's amazing. We could probably end now and just say, if you grasp that, your relationship with the Lord changes. It improves drastically your fruit, your effectiveness. Everything changes because you work from that spot of, man, this is how the Father sees me. You just work with so much more confidence and so much more appreciation for Him. That's the good news of the gospel. That's what Jesus came to do and make possible for us so that we can be reconciled with him. And how do we do that? Well, the word says we believe. Huh? Nice and easy. Another thing we sometimes overcomplicate. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, And you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. When? The moment you believed. Sealed in him. That's it. There's other hoops we need to go and jump through. You know, we add hoops. Oh, you need to be saved. Well, you better come to church because you're going to need someone to take you through the sinner's prayer first. You know, there's no sinner's prayer in the Bible. There isn't one. No. The moment you believed. When Peter stood up in, in Acts 2, he said, repent and believe. When you believe, you're sealed in him. Man, you heard the message. I believe that this is true. You're sealed in him. Yeah, the sinner's prayer is helpful. It helps because you're acknowledging it. You're saying it before. So I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. Because sometimes people don't know what to do. They want a handle. So it's a nice handle to use. But it's not a qualification. It's just a useful tool. But the key thing is that you believe. Just because someone said that sinner's prayer doesn't mean they believe it either. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not by works, so that no man can boast. It's not something you earn or jump through or got to do, you believe. And then God's gift of grace is poured out over us. But 
adding things and trying to put more steps into the process is something that's been happening from Bible times. Paul addresses it in Galatians. Like, come on, guys, really. What is going on there? This is not the gospel I preach to you. This is not what we spoke about. What are you doing? Galatians in, in chapter 3, he says, man, who bewitched you? What are you doing? Still happens. Two Corinthians five seventeen to nineteen says, "Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. We could spend forever on that as well. You're a new person in Him. All this is from God, who reconciled us to Himself." through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So Jesus did this. He made it all possible. The Father sent the Son. He's like, I want this relationship restored. You're the only one who can do this. You do it. Great. It's done. Now, you guys that are in and our relationship's been restored, your job is now to go and help other people to also have their relationship with the Father restored. We've been given that job too. And sometimes that job scares us because of what we've seen and heard and all these stories. Uh, that's for the evangelists. We can do that at the crusade. Oh, I can't just start you know, standing on a street corner or talking to strangers. And, and, and so it becomes this whole big thing that sometimes we're too scared to delve into because that's not me. I am not an extrovert. I'm an introvert. I struggle with that kind of thing, uh, whatever the case may be. Let me say there's many ways that we can do this. God knows how he's wired us. He knows what scares the daylights out of you. But he's given us this ministry anyway. But I think sometimes we just overcomplicate things again. So we're going to look at... Sheesh. <laughs> I just saw the time. <laughs> I'll just finish page one or four. <laughs> Lord, yeah. Anyway, we are aiming to look at three... <laughs> Ways of doing this this morning. Three easy ways that we can all do. There's others, yes, but he has, he has practical easy ways that we can, we can go about it. I think number one, and it's going to sound simple, is we can take people to Jesus to introduce them to him. And I'm going to look at Mark chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse 1 to 5, and then I'm going to read from verse 11 to 12. It says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, digging through it, and then they lowered him on the mat, the man. Uh, lowered the mat the man was laying on. Jesus saw their faith and said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. And then down to verse 11, says, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. They brought their buddy to Jesus. And nothing was going to stop them from getting him there. They didn't get there and say, oh, the place is too full. Sorry, bud. The matter is for you. Like, no, we're going to dig through this guy's roof until we can get you in there. Consequences be what they may. We are getting you in there. Can you imagine being in there? Sitting there listening to Jesus preaching the word, which I'm sure was amazing. And then all of a sudden, the pieces of the roof start falling down. And these clowns come and make this big hole in the roof and start lowering their buddy through there. 
in the middle of your meeting. It's like, man, we're busy here. What are you doing? But they were determined, we are getting him to Jesus. He needs Jesus and nothing's going to stop us getting him there. And you know what else is amazing? Jesus saw their faith. He never, ever mentions that guy in the match faith. <laughs> Man, I see the faith of your friends. Because of your faith, he performs a miracle because of their faith. And sometimes we're, we're, we're putting expectations on people that, that we don't need. Just get them before Jesus. Don't, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, when your faith is ready, uh, you know, then when you know enough, I'll, 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 let me give you some foundational points and then bring you to church and introduce you to him. Just get them in his presence. Just introduce them to him somehow or another. Man, you need Jesus. Let's go. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to take you somewhere so that you can meet him. We, we, the very first home group or life group that, that Judith and I started, we were part of a big group, and they said, oh, man, you guys go start your own group, and you can pick any two people in this group to go with you. So we picked these two girls. They were about 19, maybe 20, and the people looked at us and said, what? why didn't you pick like the mature people who know so much more? You know? We're like, no, because they, they, they know people, and they can speak to people. And that group grew through people being saved all the time because they would go to work. And people, they, they were, you, know, you know those people you get that you, you just feel like you can talk to them. You don't even know them that well. And you just, without even, you're just putting out all your life issues. And, and so that both of them were like that. People would just come and tell them their life issues, new strangers. And they'd say, you know what, you need Jesus. Come to our home group on Wednesday night and we're going to find out there. We don't know the answers, but we can take you to where you can find them. And then they'd phone and say, I'm bringing someone from work. They're struggling with this issue. Is it all right if we talk about this on Wednesday? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> talk about that on Wednesday. And they would bring them so that they could come and find the answers being Jesus. And the kingdom grew and the group grew and people were getting saved through that. Not because they were wise. No, because they were determined we're going to take you to where you can go and find Jesus. It was funny, someone was in the church, I, don't, I couldn't remember who it was, so you may still be here. <laughs> We're like, hey, how did you find out about the church? They said, no, a friend, I was going through some things, and a friend of mine said, uh, you need Jesus, and this is where you can go and find him. I was like, oh, I've never seen your friend, <laughs> but they sent him here. Bring people to where they can find Jesus. It's just like, man, I don't have the answer. Jesus has the answer. Let me take you there. Let me take you to go and find it. So we take people to Jesus. We take Jesus to people. Do it the other way around. Mark 9, verse 18 to 26, says, When he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him, being Jesus, and said, My, my daughter has just died. Come and put your hand on her. And she will live. Jesus got up, went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then a woman had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, came up behind him, touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I can touch his cloak, I'll be healed. Jesus turned and saw her take hard daughter. He said, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away. The girl's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, and after the crowd had been put outside, he went in, took the girl by the hand, and she got up. And news spread all through the region. So the synagogue leader, he has a situation that where only Jesus can turn this thing around. Like, Jesus, I need you to come with me. My daughter's died. I need you to come and do something. Mary and Martha, when Lazarus died, as well, also said, somebody, he said to somebody, go and fetch Jesus, we need him to come here. We need him to come and be in this situation. If you're a pie player, I'm sorry, Jesus got rid of them first. <laughs> so all the pie players were making a noise, so he got rid of them. So, If you play the sax, we do appreciate you, and we'd love to have you a part of the team. <laughs> 
but he got rid of all the noise. I think sometimes we, we, we get, Jesus gets drowned out by the noise. We need to get rid of the noise sometimes. He said, Jesus, we need you in this situation. We need to hear your voice in this situation. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of people's opinions. There's a lot of people telling us what to do. There's doctors that have said this. There's whatever. We need to hear you. Get rid of the noise. Say, Lord, I need your voice in this situation. When you're talking to people and they're like telling you the life story and it's this and this and this and this and this and it just sounds like a mess. Just say, you know what? We need to bring Jesus into the situation. Let's turn down the noise for a sec. I know what people have said. I understand that, but Jesus is sovereign. And he can turn this around. It looks like it's beyond redemption, but nothing's beyond his redemption. They said she's dead. Jesus said no. They laughed at him. They may laugh at you when you say, Jesus can still pull this thing out. But he did. And when he did, news of him spread everywhere. And when you see that person at work carrying something heavy, and you say, man, you know, what's, what's weighing so heavy on you? And they pour you need Jesus. Can I bring Jesus into the situation? Can I pray for you? There's a lot going on. And I'm not going to try and counsel. I'm just wanting to say, let's bring Jesus into the situation. Can I pray for you? Can I tell you, if, if he's put it on your heart to do, he's moved you with compassion for this person. It could be because he wants to do something. Jesus did stuff because he was moved with compassion. The mother that came out of the city was walking into her son had died. Jesus looked and said, this is all, that son is all she had left. He was moved with compassion and then he healed the son. They didn't ask him. They didn't know anything. They didn't even know who he was. Even after he healed, uh, brought the kid back to life, they still didn't know who he was. They're like, who's this guy? Is he like a prophet or something? What's up with this guy? If Jesus, if you're feeling compassion for somebody in a situation they're going through, maybe, just maybe, he's wanting to do something. And you take that little step out and you say, man, you're going through a lot. Can I pray for you? You know what? Sometimes they may say no. I've had that. I've had someone ask, can I go and pray for them? Because they're in some end of days situation. And then I get there. And I say, okay, it's okay. They told me the whole story. And then I say, okay, can I pray for you? No. You ask me here, dude. <laughs> To come and pray for you. What's up with this? So it's fine. I'll go pray for you by myself. <laughs> you can't stop me praying for you. <laughs> I'm not going to pray for you here, but I'm telling you when I'm in the car driving away, I'm going to be praying for you. I'm going to bring Jesus into this situation one way or another. That's one of the things that I love about Rev 58. You know, that meeting where we put out for prayer requests. Because it's a great tool to do this one and the next step. It's a great tool to bring Jesus into a situation. Look, I know you're struggling with this. On Sunday, our church is going to be praying for a whole bunch of people. That's what the whole service is about. Can we pray for you too? And you know, we've heard, you know, and what I love the most is hearing the fruit of those conversations where somebody's taking a step and say, can we pray for you? And the response has been amazing. From people who don't even believe he exists, who are proclaimed atheists, start weeping. You would really do that for me? You're bringing Jesus in the situation, and they start to feel that love that he has for them. They start to feel that compassion that he has for them. You said love and compassion this morning, didn't you, Cameron? Yeah, see, I knew it was going to come up somewhere. <laughs> we bring Jesus into the situation. They start to feel it. Why? Because the Lord's at work and you're speaking life instead of all the death that they've been hearing from everybody else. And then lastly, sometimes we go 
to Jesus on behalf of people. So we bring people to Jesus, Jesus to people, and we can just go and stand in the gap for people. And say, Lord, I'm going to keep praying for this person. I'm going to be that watchman you spoke about in Isaiah 62 that's on the wall and doesn't give you rest day or night. I'm going to keep praying until something happens one way or another. In Matthew 8, 5 to 13, it says, When Jesus entered Capernaum, a, century came, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? All right, he's looking at one of the previous things we've done. Are you bringing me to the person? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell one, go and he goes. The other one, come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and does it. When the Lord heard this, he was amazed. He said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done, just as you believe it would. And the servant was healed at that moment. When you read on, it says that he got back and he asked, at what time did this uh, servant become well? And they worked it out and he said, that's the exact time I was speaking with Jesus about it. He went and stood in the gap on behalf of uh, his servant. We can go and stand in the gap on behalf of people. Lord, we need, we, we, we're praying for this person. We're lifting that. There's another thing of, of F58. It's just standing in the gap on behalf of other people. And we've seen the fruit of that. This is not theory. It works. It worked here. The centurion went and stood in the gap and said to Jesus, please help. Jesus even offered to go to his house. He said, no, you don't need to. I know who you are. I know what authority you have. And you can, uh, you, you can bring the healing just as well as if you were there, just by standing here and saying so. That's the authority he has. And standing in the gap on behalf of people is an incredible thing to do. And God responds to that. I shared before, I was watching... Uh, uh, just a, a documentary on, 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 on the police back in South Africa and uh, a lot of witchcraft and those kind of th weird things that happened there. And uh, so the police had a unit specifically for that. And so they were interviewing this girl uh, and she was now working with the police. She was quite high up in the occultic stuff, right? And so the interviewer says, so how the heck did you go from where you were to this? He says, she said, my grandmother prayed for me every single day. And one day, right in the middle of one of our rituals, I could, the love of God just hit me like a, uh, what are those, a wrecking ball. Right in the middle, and she said what they're doing, I'm not going to share that because it's a little gruesome. Come with a PG. But right in the middle of that, boom. The love of God just hit her, and she, could, she couldn't be there. She couldn't wait to get out of there, and she knew she's risking her life. But the love of God hit her, and, the, and she puts it down to her grandmother that prayed for her every single day. And you know there's many people, we've, we've heard testimonies, ah, oh, this person prayed for me every day. They were praying for me. They continued praying for me. Guys, don't shortchange the value of standing in the gap on somebody else's behalf. Don't shortchange your speaking life over them again and again and again. Don't shortchange. We're saying, I speak Jesus, right? Don't shortchange the power that comes with that. A lot of people got a lot of things to say, but man, we want to speak what Jesus says. And we want to speak it again and again. And we want those living waters to keep flowing into those situations. Says in Isaiah, man, when 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 his spirit pours on desert lands, 
And we look at some of the people we're praying for, and we're like, that is a desert. There is no kingdom life there whatsoever. He said, no, no. When the Holy Spirit starts to rain, he turns those deserts into fertile soil. And then from there, he turns it into a forest. Keep speaking the life of Jesus over people and over situations. Man, to say to somebody, man, I, I know you don't believe in this, but I want you to know I'm going to be praying for you. And then you pray for them. We had back then some businesses that were like, for some reason, f- for a season, we'd go and pray in a business, and then the businesses were turning around, and so word was spreading, and so there's like, we got this guy to come pray for our business. Things turned. There were people that had no intention of ever setting foot in the church, but they were like, uh, hey, Brennan, I heard about you from this other guy. Can you come and pray for our business? We go there, speak, like pray, and then when things turn around, go back and say, like a month or six weeks later, how's it going? Oh, yeah, yeah things turn around. It was good. I said, but yeah, you know it was good, right? We prayed that that would happen. We prayed that this would happen. God is the one who moved. Oh, yeah, you know what? Actually, you're right. I didn't even think of that. Often when we've reconciled people with the Lord, we could reconcile with each other at the same time. Ephesians 2, 14 to 16 says, For himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law and its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. When we reconcile people with Jesus, we often reconcile people with each other as well. Remember we spoke about unity a few weeks ago. Man, He brings us into unity. It's up to us to maintain it. But he brings people together. I'm going to leave it there. This is the ministry of reconciliation we've been given. It doesn't need to be this complicated, scary thing. No, it can just be simple, conversational. You know what? Can I bring Jesus into this situation? You know what? Can I take this situation to Jesus? Or you know what? I'm just going to stand in the gap for the situation until the Lord comes and does something. We're reconciling as part of our job. And I'd just like to take a minute. And if there's somebody you've had on your heart that you've been feeling compassion for, that you think, Lord, please, can you intervene in this situation? I want to give you a minute now. To pray for those people. A family member who you, who you think, man, this, I, w- I wish they'd just get a revelation of Jesus. I wish they'd just see him and see how awesome he is. This situation is beyond help except Jesus is the only one who can pull this back. I just want to give you a minute now to think about those people and just lift them up to him. Just stand in the gap on their behalf. Just pray, Lord, you come in and do what only you can do. Lord, we thank you that... Your word says we stand holy without blemish and free from accusation before you. So it's with real boldness, but with love and grace and mercy. And Lord, we want to come and stand before this morning and stand in the gap for, for some people, Lord, for some situations. And Lord, ask that you move your hand in a way that they know that it was you who moved your hand, Lord. That it's undeniably you that gets the glory, Lord. Lord, for those that we may have been praying for that just have no relationship with you, Lord, we will lift us that they, they get a revelation of you, Lord. They have encounters with you, Lord. Because there's, there's no better way to discover you than a, a, just a straight one-on-one encounter with you. Where it's undeniably you at work, Lord. Lord, situations that may be around where doctors have said, no, it's too late, it's dead, I think it's hilarious that we want to pray. Lord, that you move your hand in the situations, Lord. Lord, where there's a lot of people facing tough times and there's a lot of noise, that you help dial that noise down, let them hear your voice clearly, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen.